exciting. It's not anywhere near as glamorous or sexy as people think it is. It's not like sitting in an office five days a week, eight hours a day for like five years. It's just you work for a couple months or a month and then you're a different job. A lot of discipline and uh, ambition I think will take you a really long way. Working 12 hours a day, 14, 16, 18 hours a day in rain and sleet and in bad weather or the heat. I mean, you're just, you're, you're people who are exactly the same. You, really, you share the same love. You, you're not constrained by having to look a certain way or having to necessarily behave a certain way um, on a when you work in film. You can still, you know, it's a, the, the people that hire you tend to be a little bit more open-minded. Uh, they don't care if you, know, you have a mohawk or... Yeah. They don't care how you dress, or they don't care if you're gay, or you know what I mean. Like they, you know, these things just don't matter that much. You have a family that's rooted and grounded in the real world, and then you're in the film world, and it is another world. You know, it's um, and they conflict all the time. You end up sacrificing so much of of what you like and who you are for something different. I love film. I want to take it as far as I can. It's what I love most, but I've had to give up a lot of things that I love because there's no time for it. It's a cut. That's a cut. That's a cut. it up. Stand by. Have that camera. This is Pictures up. Pictures up. Roll it. We're rolling. Just swing the cable back. Okay, let's do it right then. I'd like to put some bags on on the left side too. Craig, can you find me, give me a weather forecast, the latest weather forecast? Tell him to stand, who's, who's on walking with him? Brooke, Brooke, tell him to do nothing now for a minute or two. Tell him I'm gonna be on the base holding the cable up. Uh, 10 to 15. Before the bus is right? For what? No, for wind. 10 to 15, good, yeah. okay, thanks. And um, the bus is still stuck, can I pull? We're doing the manual labor, but to bring about, a, you know, a film, a, a piece of art. Um, so what you do to get there is blue collar, but you're also thinking, I guess, white collar. I'm the third electric and Casey's the best boy electric. So I can... The hierarchy goes from director of photography to the key um, grip and the gaffer. And we work under the gaffer, the head of the lighting department. I'm a gaffer, so I'm the head of the electric department. Mostly, like, my role is more managerial. The DP gives me uh, what he wants to be done, and I give out tasks. I don't really run off set a lot. I stay on set, mostly. Sort of waiting for the DP to tell me to do something. And then I tell other people to go do it. <laughs> is what it boils down to. The best boy is in charge of taking care of equipment, ordering extra equipment. Um, paperwork and all the tedious stuff involved in the electric department and uh, running cable yeah yeah power distribution it's a very important part taking care of the generator usually on lower budget films that's a necessity and then definitely on a shoot where you only have one third like Andrea she's like always on set and always like right there with the gaffer lighting I want to shoot, so naturally the, the progression is like that or learn your camera. camera. Yeah, exactly. Do it, do it through yeah. Camera. yeah, you either go through camera or lighting, and definitely the best shooters I've seen are people who know their lighting. Um, I enjoy both, which is why I do both. I know there are a lot of people who are electrics who don't like to grip, so it's usually more that. It also, um, I've only been doing this about a year. It also makes me a lot more marketable, actually. Electric will set up the light 
and then the grip is what cuts the legs. So you're looking at things from a totally different way. When I'm gripping, I'm probably more concerned with safety issues and all the rigging being safe. Well, I'm the key grip, and that's, that's, uh, key. I'm a key grip, basically. They, they're responsible for backing up the gaffer and the DP, backing them up, supporting them for whatever they need as they prepare a shot, as they do a shot. We're also responsible for organizing our crew and coordinating along with production, whatever, whatever the details are, the logistics are of setting various different shots up, dealing with locations and dealing with uh, the physics of a location. I want to go around a bed or a table. Go see how the 45 is. Can I take this? Can I take this without um, give you back a large 90? I'll break up my circle. It's a problem. <laughs> well, if it was a music video, Aaron. If you needed, I tell you, you want to keep you want to keep on for the whole shoot. Is that what you want to do? There's a day that I need it, and believe it or not, it's the first day. Then take it. I'll put it down. Take it. Will you? You, need, you, know, you just I just need, need it for one one day. To go around. To go around. I'm in, a, I'm, in a, I'm in a staircase. Ah yes. Absolutely. And I'm going around from the ups from the part the two steps below, up the corner and around. Oh yeah, that that'll do the trick. That'll definitely do the trick. So I'll take it for the day and you take you, it. Uh, return it with the two pieces of straight. I'm two extra it. pieces. I'll put it down. Go ahead. No problem. All right, thanks, man. Yeah, it's good when you've got people like that sort of uh, really ready to facilitate you and they, you know, because the whole idea with them is that they ramp on a job by job basis and they really want to make people happy. And they trust crews if crews give equipment back in good condition, they treat equipment right and they know how to use it. So you can develop a real strong relationship with someone like Iron over the years and then eventually when you go and do low budget jobs you can get a deal on the equipment. Getting a deal on the equipment for a low budget job is obviously it's really important. It means you can shoot for friends, do good pretty good camera work with friends, you know, on jobs that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it. I'm the best boy grip, and it's my job to keep track of all the grip equipment and we rig lights when it has to go up, up on a ceiling or something. We also take care of the camera and the dolly. Well, I used to be an electrician, and uh, I first started out as an electrician, and uh, it was kind of like really detail-oriented, which wasn't really me, and grip was kind of big and heavy, and <laughs> it's kind of kind of me. This is my pop. So, uh, grips are the best people on earth. I love grips more than anybody. Mr. Cozy, they're just gonna... Oh, here's a grip. Because, because of the compressor, they want to go... This is serious now. This is shop stewarding. There's, uh, they want to go past lunch, so uh -huh. they can set things up. That means you and Joe would need to stay and work. I'm all for that if it means... You see, this is an example of the grips working with the sound and helping out and everything. Yeah, that, well, I'm, I, I, of course, I'm going to vote for that, since it's in my best interest. Will you waive your male penalty, or...? I'll, uh, ah! Yeah. Okay. Most of us are. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Shit. Thank, thank you. Thanks to the crew. Now, this is wonderful. You see, so I'm talking the team spirit. The crew is foregoing meal penalties because we've got this problem with the compressor. It's, uh, there's a real dynamic going on, but it doesn't always work, either. Um, on this film, and when I've spoken to the other crew members, they've felt the same. We've really gelled really well, especially the, there can be tension between the grips and between their electrics because people feel both of their jobs are very important. And um, usually, sometimes there'll be someone from either department who really doesn't have a respect for the other department. It'll just cause tension. Right. There's You're always one. There's one per shoot. <laughs> yeah. One guy. A bad one guy. Woman. Yeah, one bad guy. They are what they are. Sometimes Grips and, and Gabbers get along fine. This job we're doing is great. But uh, there will be politics there where the DP will throw out information the Gaffer will get first. And the Grips won't get it until the Gaffer gives it to them. The politics that can, the danger of, of the political chemistry there is that you'll have Grip and Electric in a tug of war because one will be hoping to get information so as they can do their job effectively and make things safe. But they won't get it until it's delivered to them. And if you have a gaffer rubbing shoulders too closely with a DP, um, that information will be harder to get. And that's just the way people are. Yeah, I mean, some people right. just want to constantly make this one gaffer I know who will remain nameless. Well, uh, I mean, this guy just kisses ass and schmoozes like the whole day long. I mean, that's that's what he does. And I'm, you know, I'm the key girl. I'm busting my ass doing all the rest of this stuff, and he just schmoozes, and it pisses me off. 
you know that he's but that's what he does and 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 that's his job and you know he gets more work and then you know as a gaffer and then hires me to be a key grip so i'm like you know do what you got to do but you know just as long as i as long as i work hard you know it's it doesn't really matter what so yeah grips are just animals oh. <laughs> Take it back. <laughs> nah, I, I do take it back, because I'm probably going to get beat up for that. <laughs> and they walked away with the impression of me that I was a complete animal. What's the, uh, what's the difference between a grip and electric? What? Uh, an electric takes the dishes out of the sink before he pees in it. No, use the sink. The sink is another vessel. I wouldn't say that they're pigs at all. I mean, I've always gotten, it depends. You have to, I mean, there are different kinds of women. Some get along with men very well, and then there's also like real girly girls, and there aren't that many girly girls on a set, period, really, even, even the makeup and wardrobe, you know, there's still, there's, there's a strength about them. But these people like that you've just spoken of are the most gentlemanly people I've ever worked with in how they deal with everyone on set, you know, helping out the other departments with whatever, whether it be carrying stuff or accommodating them, they, it's, so that's very funny for them to consider themselves pigs. Because <laughs> they're not. <laughs> if I feel like I'm not being listened to, or if I feel like there's a, a tension or an arrogance going on, then it'll just, it'll frustrate me. Yeah, it'll affect me. Those politics will affect me in the sense that that person, for example, producers who don't know what they're doing because they don't have the experience, but they're hiring crew people who've done tons and tons of jobs who do have the experience, and they, they have the experience of being treated well. I guess they're referring to a lot of times there seems to be a tension between like above the line, below the line, technical versus the production crew. So all the technical and, and that would mean all the departments, the sound department or you know, makeup, wardrobe, art director, like that group versus the ADs and the producers. They try and look out for each other. Well, I think what really gets under um, the crew's skin is when, you know, the whole penny wise pound foolish approach which you run into a lot in independent filmmaking and it where they'll they try to cut the wrong corners and in the wrong way and therefore alienate their crew and alienate the people around them i had one horrible job where checks were bouncing at the end of every week we had to fight literally fight to get our checks. I think a smart producer, and you do work for him, this film has had pretty smart producers on it, realize that it's, a, it's all about costs and in the big picture, just keeping you, by keeping their crew happy, they're gonna, you know, save themselves money in the long run. Just to even recognize each person's work, um, a couple of DPs go around and thank everyone at the end of every day. Just, you know, little things like that, or even recognize your presence on the set I think is important because everyone works really hard no matter what you're doing you know whether you're a PA or the gaffer and it's important that everyone get appreciated I think the worst I worked to this DP once who like I was best boy on this thing and like he was such an asshole he's from LA and like he freaked out got upset about something and went and kicked all my like went over to my box and kicked all the cables out of the box you know, for no reason, like, this one over and started, like, kicking the box, and I'm like, what are you doing, you know? And he just looks at me, and he's like, get those back up, and walks away. Oh, my God. Like, oh, wow. It's like a whole new level of asshole, you know? Yeah. Somebody called me for a job. I was in L.A. Somebody called me for a job uh, because they couldn't do it and asked me would I do it, and I said yes. And uh, I think the biggest screw-up was that, uh, I think overall that I didn't, because I didn't have the experience, I didn't know how to, how to make sure that I was covered. But uh, it was on a mountain in, uh, I think, a place called the Wilfong House. And it was a music video for a band. I'm not going to tell you which band, because then I'll go look at it and it's a shit video. But, uh, and it was, what happened was there was a storm. We were using a crane. We were using dollies. We were using, it was a big thing. And they were even talking about airlifting shit in. And uh, I had fucked up because uh, I, didn't, I didn't insist that they had track for the crane. And uh, so they didn't get any. They said it was an insurance problem. So I ended up using wood on a, like a grass surface. So when the storm came and the rain came, everything started to sink. And they were insisting that we continue to shoot and I was going. I didn't know how to say no. I didn't know when to say no. So I was fucked up. Very dangerous. We did it and we got it, but, you know. 
But we did this one night on Randall's Island, which is where they train firefighters, um, and we were blowing up a building. But it was last winter when the Northeaster came up the coast, and uh, like 60 mile per hour winds, pouring, pouring, pouring rain, and we had the equivalent of a city block lit up. And it's just like uh, bare frames of buildings. So lights, lights, lights everywhere getting blown over, blowing up, things on top of scaffolding. I mean, it was really, really, really in the trenches. It ended up being like a 17, 18 hour day, because then we had to wrap out of that. And you know, getting little shocks because of all the lights that were rigged outside and everything. <laughs> I know you're such an overblown analogy, I don't even want to say it. But it's like similar, I guess, in some ways to like, uh, you know, the way to describe like a wartime situation, you know, where it's like there's so much downtime and boredom, you know, like sort of perforated by like intense moments of like decision making and excitement, or not necessarily excitement, but in intensity. <laughs> If you were a very conservative person, you certainly wouldn't go into a freelance job that had no security. That's true. That, so that those so the very conservative, the very like the like people that I went to the business Wharton Business School people that I went to school with were not going to go into the film business straight off. You know, they were going to come out, make some money, get a, a steady paying job. So those people are all eliminated. You know, and then what's left over are sort of like, you know, the people that would be <laughs> willing to do that. It's strange. A lot of people in film, even if they don't get a job call for like two months, won't go and just, I don't know, wait tables or something like other people would, other artists would do, because they're like, no, it's not in film, I'm not going to do it. God, well, a little secret, I guess it was last year, 1995, I did not work for the first five months of the year, not one single day. And that was terror, and uh, luckily, my fiance at the time, who's now my wife, is uh, she has a nice stable nine to five job at MTV. So we were able to get by just fine. But uh, five months there, I, I tell you, you can only play so much basketball <laughs> and read so many books. Usually I get hired on either because I know the DP or because um, I know the production managers. Want to end the DP doesn't have anybody or doesn't have anyone willing to work for the money I am. This <laughs> is usually how it works out. It's a great man. But that's the way we got seven day weeks at 200. Bring them in. I'll take it. I was able to couch hop all through New York for the last five months and, uh, and stay busy, stay really busy. All it takes is a pager and, you know, uh, the will to do it. There's a, a woman I know who's a script supervisor from down south who lived out of a car for three years, didn't have to pay rent. She went from job to job, was so good about getting jobs that for three years she w didn't have to pay rent. I don't enjoy it too much. I don't like living out of a suitcase. I like having a stable base. Back in 1990, when I was, oh God, in 89, when I was a senior in, at NYU, I worked on a job with Mel. I was a PA. And Mel taught me how to tie knots in 1989. He had this ambulance. It was like the coolest thing. He used to keep his grip stuff in there. And drive around an ambulance, this was in 1989. And I have nice not seen boy. Mel up until, I guess, what, like three or four weeks ago when we started working on this job together. I'd known of him and certainly heard of him since then. But uh, 1989, so it was really seven years. That that is long, huh? and that's a long freaking time ago. Working for a company it's, when you meet, well, it's when you meet each other after a few years that you go like, whoa, fuck it, I haven't done much since then. Nothing <laughs> <laughs> on. Since 1989. No, 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 no. I haven't, you know, really? I haven't bought a house. No kids. Well, I don't have any kids. Oh, I wasn't working competing with you. No, <laughs> no, I think if you're roller coasting, if, you, if you're doing a lot of work, and if you, if you accept that for a good period of the year you won't have a life, then you know, it's fine. I and mean, you can take your two, three months off, which I haven't done in 10 years, but, but we'll see. Now that there's two of us and, you know, like we're, you know, we want to buy a co-op, we want to, you know, do, you know, maybe uh, eventually have children or something. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so, you know, it's sort of uh, all of a sudden there's your responsibilities, you know, it's like with every person that becomes attached to you, you know, you like, you know, double your, or, you know, your responsibilities increase exponentially. So. If, you, if you have a big problem with how much time you're at work in film and how much time you have to yourself, you'll end up having to leave it. Like right now, my girlfriend wants to kill me because she hasn't seen me. Like she's seen me like maybe once a week for the past two weeks or so. And when she sees me, I'm exhausted and just want to sleep because she, she works six days a week, 14 hour days, and you don't want to do anything. You know, my personal life is in utter turmoil because of what I've chosen to do for a living. And it's a big sacrifice. And you know, sometimes I wonder whether it's worth it or not, but, you know, that's something I've got to figure out on my own, and, you know. When we're not working, we just, we just hang we're out always, all the time. We, we're together all the yeah. time, so, you know, we spend a lot of that time kind of laying around, watching TV and eating, but, you know. Even though we work hard and people have things to complain about or whatever, but when we're working together, you really do get a real sense of family and you do become quite close with these people. There's a whole lot of love going on. What happens is you've got 50 to 80 people stuck in this really stressful environment and you're going through all this stuff together. I mean, these intense highs and lows, you know, the intense lows where you're working in like, you know, three feet and wet snow, of uh, snow and wet snow's coming down in your head and you forgot your rain gear that day and, and it sucks. And then, you know, you're at a bar a week later and, uh, and everybody's just so free and open and it's, you know, it's it, just an amazing array and range of emotions and that's really appealing. I think it's just more kindred spirits more than anything. I mean, it's, I think that you're working with people who obviously share the same love. You know, kind of a strange group of people are attracted to film, you know, they're usually uh, a little unique. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're nuts, you know, or anything, it, but it means they do have a, a bit, of, they're more free-spirited probably and a little less conservative. <laughs> you know, you end up working, I've worked like with a couple of people on several films, you know. I think I've, I've worked with uh, a couple of the same people on like up to five, six projects. And even after all that time, you may not know their middle name. You may not know how many brothers or sisters they have, but you have like such a strong bond with them and a, uh, such a, a strong relationship. I mean, it's, you know, people you'll never forget. There are people that I worked with two years ago from LA or wherever they came from, you know, and we end up, you know, a kid from Alabama and somebody from LA working on a six week project in the swamps of Mississippi and you never forget them, you know. All I can do is hope that I get to work with them again one day. Everyone I've worked with is, is very talented in one way or another, and they all seem to have that artistic mentality. You're the only person who read the first script I ever wrote. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, probably one of two people who's read the second one at this point, yeah. I guess. I sent it in to a guy we both know, um, a producer, uh, not so much as, uh, well, like with the hope that he would like it, obviously, but uh, more with uh, sort of just to get a feel and see what he thought of it. We want a whole project to be ours that we have total control of because I think right now he likes what he's doing, but it's still ultimately not his baby. Yeah, I want to eventually shoot myself, and my sister and I have hopes of working together, co-directing and producing our own movie. I want to do my own, I want to have the freedom to do my own work. I want to have the freedom to have my own space. Um, and I want to use my brain more, and I'm working on it. But it's like, it, it, you know, there's no standard in film. There's no, like, age bracket where you're, okay, you're 25, you should be shooting, or you should be gaffing. There's none of that. So there's a lot of leeway, but then again, people get burned out really quickly, I think. I never want to get jaded. There are lots of people who've like worked in film for a long time, know the routine, and um, just get jaded. They they get burned out, and that's when you should move on. The only time I feel burnout is when I've been working as of now for like a year without a week off. You know, <laughs> that would be nice, and have some more personal time, and uh, get back in the real world a little bit. But. Uh, um, 
Yeah, I could see, I could see growing old with this, definitely. How many grips does it take to screw in a light bulb? Five, one to do it, and four to tell you how they did it on their last job. And uh, an electric joke, uh, well, you could apply that to an electric yeah, as well, to the light bulb thing. Switch. None of them can hear me, can they? Huh? Eh? Eh? Tony Curtis is there, and he's, you know, he, he just brings like a different energy level to the set. Long whoopie pie. It's a whoopie oh. pie. It's like the same thing, but oval. <laughs> <laughs> oh, does it have cream in it? Cream? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sweetened cream. <laughs> you know what that sweet cream's made of now? It's lard, it's something yeah, like that. Like, Shit, it's so bad for you, but, but it keeps you going, huh? <laughs> and what was the question again? <laughs>